Jesus' name. There is power in the word of God. In Jesus' name. Father Lord, we exalt and honor you because of whom you are. We thank you for your gracious name. And there is wonderful thing you have done today. We thank you for the privilege, not only to worship you, but to stand in aware of your presence. Knowing that all things work together for good. For those that love God and for those who are called according to his purpose. Father Lord, your covenant you will not break. You will not alter the word that proceed from your mouth. You have spoken once and twice at my head. Power actually belongs to God. All power on earth, in the land, in the sea, in the heights, they belongs to God. Father Lord, that's why tonight, as we have come together to understand your prophecy, to know what you have to teach us, open our eyes with your understanding. Holy Spirit, the Lord left you with us to comfort us, to direct us and to guide us, to teach us and to open our eyes to the truth. Holy Spirit, lead us to the truth. Help us to expand it to the pure. Lord, guide us in every step of the way that your name alone will be glorified. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Brethren, today we are on another week. This is Sunday evening by 5 p.m. Time would normally take the topic under the Open House Fellowship, which is Understanding Prophecy. Understanding Prophecy is a weekly activity which we use opportunity to search the scriptures and know what the Bible has to offer. This is the time Christians come together to know what the Bible is actually talking about their day-to-day -day activity, their lifestyle, how they live, and what will be after the churches, when the church is taken out of the earth. Last week, we concluded the letters to the churches. During this period, we understood that letters to each of the seven churches was particularly written to churches of all generation, of different background and of different persuasion. We have some letters written to the Pentecostal churches, written to the mother church, written to the today's church, and we have letters that was written unto the missionary church, the apostolic church, and the visionary church. But today, we are stepping further into chapter 4 to look at the things that happen after the church during the marriage feast of the Lamb. When the church are called up to heaven to witness everything from Mezzanine, when we from up look down to the earth to see the plan that God has for the world at the end of all things. When the saint is taken out of the earth, and when that which holdeth is taken out of the way, that the man of sin should be revealed in his time. This is a glimpse of the vision and the preamble of things to come. During also the period where the earth we experience such judgment under the reign of the Antichrist, which is also known as the first three and a half year before the three and a half year of the Great Tribulation. That is what we are going to dive into. While these teachings might sound technical, it is not in dog to create fear in any believers or to make you frightened about what God is about to do. But this message is given so that life can be saved, so that the saints can be equipped to present themselves holy and sanctified. Because the Lord is coming for a church without spots, a church without wrinkle, a church that there is no anthem of death. The bride gives you, the bridegroom gives you a garment, and the garment he gave you was spotless. And he is coming also to take you home in that spotless garment. He doesn't want a garment spotted with the world or spotted with sin. And that's why today, as we look into this chapter, it's going to be a pivotal point in our life for those who are already Christian to double down their efforts and for those 
who are sent to check their life and update the valid points in their life that has gone down. And that is the purpose of this teaching. This teaching is not meant to frighten anyone or to hyperbole to tell you about the vision of hell. No. This lesson is meant to convert soul, to teach you about the Great Commission, which the Lord leave us with. The Lord Jesus would not leave us with this message if it was not necessary to save life now. And that's why today we are taking the steps into the book of Revelation to explain the things that happen after the churches. On the things that happen after the churches, this is the preamble, the part one of the things that happen after the churches. As we start this message today, we are looking at a text from Revelation chapter 4. When the saints are called up to heaven, things that happen up there. So our text today is taken from the book of Revelation chapter 4. Before we start, today I will be your host. My name is Missionary Collins. I host the Open House Fellowship online. And we use this opportunity to teach all our mission members and those who wish to participate. This is a non-denominational fellowship. The focus is to prepare the same for the work of the ministry. So this is a non-church service or non-denominational, non-political service. But our purpose is to save life and to gather people for the Great Commission, which the Lord Jesus Christ has left to us. The only command he gave to us as he was departing the earth. And we heard what the angel says, that the same Jesus we see going up, in like manner we will see him coming down. And before he comes down to gather the saints together for the great judgment of the white throne, he is saying to us that we must finish this gospel of the kingdom to all nations as a testimony against them, so that the end can come. And that is the purpose why the church and millions of other missionaries out there in the world are committed to finishing this task before the Lord's return. Since we don't know the day the Lord's return, we are using every medium available to us to make sure that this gospel of the kingdom is preached to all nations as a testimony, not only for saving souls, but also as a testimony against the nation who refuse to listen before the end can come. God bless you as you listen. Uh, today, a text is taken from the book of Revelation chapter 4, which says, what is the main message of Revelation chapter 4? Revelation chapter 4 begins with John's vision of the future. John sees a door in heaven and is invited to come up higher. So before we start, I would like us to read from the book of Revelation chapter 4 from verse 1. And it said, After this, I look, and I behold the door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard addressing me like a calling of a war trumpet said, Come up here. And that is the sound when we hear the Bible keep talking about the rapture, though the word the rapture itself was not found in the scripture. But when we talk about the rapture, we're talking about the trumpet sound when the saints of God are gathered up. And that is exactly what this place is talking about here. That the door was open in heaven. That the voice he heard was like a trumpet saying to him, come up. So the trumpet will sound, but it's secret. Only the saints will hear the Lord call. And the call of the trumpet is saying to the saint, come up here. The blast of the trumpet of God. The Lord is not coming to the earth. The trumpet is that the saint will meet up with him in heaven. The same manner we see Jesus ascend. But this ascension of the saint is about different. The Bible says, in a twinkle of an eye, we shall be changed. That this mortality will put on immortality. And also, not only the saints will be changed, but the dead in Christ will rise first. So that is what the rapture is all about. And that is exactly what John is alluding here. And this event happened at the close of the church. 
Let's get a prehistory of the church. How did the church exist in Act of Apostles? The church came in a miracle. Mysterious speaking of unknown tongue that everybody that were listening heard in their local language. That was how the new covenant church was born. And this is not to say that the church is a building. The church is the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer embodied in the life of a believer. That is the church. The mystery church. That's why the, the Bible tells us that our body is the temple of God. We are God himself to us. That God worship within us. So we are the church, not the building, not the gathering seat, not the peak population, but we as an individual embodied with the Holy Spirit is God's church. And that when we talk about things that happen after the church, that means things that happen after the saints are taken out of the earth. It doesn't mean there will be no congregational church or there is no building. No, the building will remain the way they are. But the church itself are gone. Because the church is not the multitude. The church are the believers. When the believers are taken out, the church ministry ends. And that brings the time of the Gentile to a close. So the time of the Gentile has prevalation from the beginning of the trampling down of Jerusalem to the time of the Antichrist. And this is the period which is known as the period of the Gentile. And the Bible says the Gentile will tread down the holy place, even Jerusalem, until their period is being fulfilled. And this time of the Gentile, as we specify, the church, the mystery church, is neither Jews nor Gentile, but embodied as the Holy Spirit taken from the Gentile embodied with fewer Jews who believe in Christ. And after the reign of the church, the Jews will return back to their rituals and religions. But what happened to the rest of the world? The rest of the world will face the sword judgment under the reign of the Antichrist. So that is the period we are talking about here. And that is the period that then blankets between the tribulation and the three and a half years during the period which the Antichrist himself will not be violent, nor will he treat people with subcoity, but he is trying to rise to power. The Bible said to us, he went conquering to conquer. So he himself is not going to strike through violent, but he will make his strike through peace. And this first peace will promote world unity. And the Bible says, by peace he shall deceive many. And that is exactly why today we take a glimpse of the scriptures to know exactly why the trumpet was calling the saints to come up here. Remember what the message, the angels of the Lord that were sent to destroy Sodom said to Lot that Lot should flee to the mountain, that they cannot do anything until Lot depart. And there is something we know in theology, it's known as the law of expositional constancy. That means the Holy Spirit tends to interpret Indian from the beginning of the scripture to the end. In the Indian he used, they are consistent from Genesis to Revelation. And God said in Sodom that he cannot do anything until Lot, who was a righteous child of God, is out of Sodom. The same thing, God cannot unleash his tribulation on earth because he promised that we shall not endure his wrath. And there can never be great tribulation on earth as long as there is still one saint remaining. Because God will not punish the righteous with the wicked. Remember what he said to Abraham, God forbid that he should punish the wicked with the righteous or that the Lord should do wickedly. Because God himself will not punish the righteous with the wicked. For any judgment to be passed on earth, the Holy Spirit and the saints must be taken out of the earth. Then shall the judgment of the Lord upon the creatures fall. Remember why Moses and the children of Israel bothered Moab for 40 years. The Lord told Moses that the, that the iniquity of the Amorites was not yet full. Despite their idol worship, 
their wickedness, their human sacrifice, but their iniquity was not yet full in the sight of the Lord. As a result of that, their judgment could not come. So today we wonder, with all the evils and the things we hear on earth, why is the earth still remains solid and nothing is happening? Why is God's judgment not coming upon the earth despite our wickedness and the covering up of murder and other things on earth? The reason is simple. Because the iniquity of the earth is not yet full. But somebody will ask, when will the iniquity of the earth be full? We can see that in the book of Psalm. Let's go to the book of Psalm and see when the iniquity of the earth will be full. Psalm 2, from verse 1. He said, Why does the nation assemble with commotion and uproar and confusion of voices? And why does the people imagine and meditate upon or devise an empty scheme? And the kings of the earth take their places, and the ruler take counsel together against the Lord. And who his anointed one, which is the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And they say, let us break their band of refrain asunder and cast the cord of control from over us. He who sits in heaven will see this situation and he will laugh. But the Lord himself had them in derision, in supreme contempt. He mock at them. So, this is when they are wrought with before. When the kings of the earth sit down and assemble together in commotion and uproar and confusion of voices, and why do people imagine and meditate and devise evil and empty screen against the Lord? And the king take their places and the ruler take counsel together against God himself. And they will and against Christ, and they will say to themselves, Let us break the bank from us. Let's take the earth for ourselves. We know He created the earth, but now He's no longer here. The earth is our home. Let's take it for ourselves. And the ruler take counsel together against God and against Jesus Christ, His anointed servant. And they will say, Let us break His bank and sunder. And cast away his authority from over our head. But you know what God looks at this? He laughs. Because the Lord Himself had them in derision, in supreme content. He mocked at them. But He speak to them in a deep anger and trouble, and terrified and found in them in His displeasure and fury, saying, Yet have I set my king on Zion, my holy hill. The Lord himself knew that the cup of the world, that's what all the evil we can imagine. And no many authors of the Bible wrote, if God refused to punish America for all the evil they've done, that he will apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Yes, Sodom and Gomorrah have their time, but the evil of the earth is not yet full. Until the world decides to rise against God and against his anointed son, Jesus Christ. That is when they are called will be full. That is when he will call up the saints and judgment that is made for the earth will pass upon them. And then there will be no one righteous man left in the earth because God will take them away. Because the punishment of the wicked and the righteous cannot be the same. I know many Christians have several theory that the saints will be preserved through the tribulation. No, God did not write that in the scripture. He only told us that the Jews will be protected throughout the tribulation, not the Christian. The Christians who are left during the tribulation or who converted during the tribulation, they will suffer the same sort of judgment as the rest of the world. But their blood will attest for their own testimony because the time of grace is over. But this is exactly what the mystery of the saints in the book of Revelation was talking about. John was caught up. Why was John not showed 
the mystery of the churches was shown to John while John was still on earth in the island of Patmos, where he was exiled. Why was the rest of the mystery of the revelation not shown to John in Patmos? Why must he have to be transported in time to the days of the Lord? Because if you read Revelation chapter 1, he makes us understand that I was in spirit on the Lord's day. The Lord took him forward in time into the future to see these things that will happen at the days of the Lord. And for the rest part of the revelation to be shown to John, John don't have to be part. John never saw himself as part of those who were enduring the great tribulation on earth. But rather he was watching them from heaven. And he see the presentation of the throne of God and the decoration of the archangels. But he never saw the judgment upon the earth directly from the earth. But he was watching them from our earth. Just as God is watching it, so was we. So shall the saint also be watching. And there is something also that was not available in the vision of the true room in Zechariah. Zechariah is one of the minor prophets in the scripture. The vision of heaven, Zechariah saw every other thing, but he never saw the 24 elders. They were new things. Zechariah prophecy, vision of the true room did not see it. Isaiah prophecy did not see the 24 elders. Neither does Jeremiah or Ezekiel saw it. But somebody saw it. That was John. The 24 elder was a new addition to the vision. The reason is because the 24 elder did not exist in the time of Isaiah or Ezekiel or Zechariah. The reason is because the church has not ascended into heaven. Because how do we know who these 24 elders are? Because of the son they sing. They sing the son of the redeemed. That was slain and has made us king and prince unto our God. And from the New Testament, we understand who are king and prince. And that is the church. So, now let's go back to our story. Revelation chapter 4 begins, John's vision of the future. John sees the doors open in heaven. And he was invited to come up higher. And a glimpse of God's plan for the divine perspective. And there he sees the throne of God, and the earth, and its terrestrial glory, and many exalted beings singing praises unto God and the Lamb. Who are these exalted beings? We can read it clearly from our scripture in verse 2. It said, from verse 1, I read again, this revelation of Jesus Christ, Revelation chapter 4. From verse 1. He said, After this, I look and behold a door standing up, open in heaven. And the first verse which I heard was addressing me like the calling of a war trumpet, saying, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place in the future. At once, I came up. On the spirit, I came up under the Holy Spirit and power, and behold, the truth stood in heaven. Let's read it clearly from King James and see what he said in verse 2. He said, Immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, the throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat on the throne was like Jasper and his sardine stone. And there was a rainbow around about the throne, in the sight like unto an emerald. Then that rainbow around the throne, what symbol does that signify in the scripture? We remember when God, after the act of Noah, when Noah came out of the ark, he was afraid of the destruction of the earth again with water. God make an everlasting covenant to him that he would not destroy the earth again with water, no matter the evil on earth. But why is this rainbow in heaven around the throne? God kept it as a symbol of covenant. That shows you the Lord you serve is a covenant keeper. 
The covenant he made with Noah extended to heaven, even to the last day. That's why he never would destroy the whole world with water. And that is the reason why the rainbow surrounds the true like an emerald. And this is the color of light. And around about the throne were four and twenty seats. Four and twenty seats. And upon the seat I saw four and twenty elders seated, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their head crown of gold. That's something strange again. The twenty and four elders, who are they? Is there any significance of 24 in the scripture? Yes. When David discovered that the order of the priest in Levitical priest at which they offered sacrifice in the temple was chaotic, David decided to divide the Levitical priest in 24 courses. And so that means each priest will be on the duty twice a year. And that is exactly the replica of the 24 elders you see in heaven. They are king and priest. How do we identify that? Then? By the song which they sing, the song of the redeemed. So the next set of people we see, the elders were taken as a representative of all believers, all the saints of the earth. They are the representative. They are quoted as king and priest. And they shall stand before God. That means all the saints who take part in the marriage feast of the Lamb. So that means one of them will be on duty once or twice a year or depends on heavenly time. So they are representative of all the saints. So that is the reason why you see 24 seats on the throne. Clothed with white raiment, and they had their head crowned of gold. And out of the throne proceed lightly thundering and voices, and there was several lamb of fire burning before the throne, which are the spirits of God. Remember the seven lamps and the seven candlesticks. Where were they in verse 2 and 3? They were on earth in verse 1. But now in verse 4, they are in heaven. That's strange. Remember what Jesus told all these seven candlesticks and seven lampstands were? They were the seven churches and the spirits of the seven churches or the angels of the seven churches. Now, in verse 1, they were on earth where John was standing. Now they are in heaven. So strange. If the church will not be righteous, how come they were on earth? Now they are in heaven. That means the rapture of the saints indeed take place. Then, we go further to understand the set of the throne of grace. And in verse 6, we understand that before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around about the throne were four living creatures full of eyes before and behind. First, these living creatures are not strange because they are in the Old Testament. In Isaiah prophecies, they were there. They are the Spirit of God sent throughout all the earth. And we knew who they were because the Bible specified who they were. And we know the sea of glass. This prelude to Genesis that God divided water from water. He gathered the water under the firmament and the water above the firmament. And the water above the firmament. That is the sea of crystal, which we descend as standing. And that also symbolizes water. As Christians, we stand on the word of God in heaven. So that is exactly what those things symbolize. So there is nothing strange, no interpretation here that was strange. Though they are figures of speeches, but they are just simply Bible texts which God has referred to throughout the scripture. In verse 6, and before the throne, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, which we already alluded to, separated water from water, the water below the firmament and water above the firmament. That the water below the universe, which we have today, we call sea, 
and the water above the universe, which is the sea of glass in heaven. So, in the midst of the throne and around about the throne, there were four beasts or four living creatures full of eyes behind and before. We already know who they are from the Old Testament. They are the Spirit of God. They are the eyes of God that run through and flow the earth, which sees all things. And before the throne, there was a sea of glass. In verse 7, we say the first living creature was like a lion, which is significant. And the second living creature was like a calf. And the third one was like the face of a man. And the fourth was like a flying eagle. And these four living creatures, each of them has six wings. Remember the ceremony which Isaiah and Ezekiel refer to in heaven. By two wings they cover their face, by two wings they did fly, by two wings they cover their feet. These are the children. And the seas wings about them, they were full of eyes within, and the rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was, is, and is to come. Remember how he presented himself unto Moses. I appear unto Abraham in the name of God Almighty. Unto Isaac in the name of God Almighty. In my name Jehovah, which means I am, and they know not unto me. And this is the symbol of those living creatures. Now let's take a perspective. Zechariah's visions of the true room in Zechariah chapter 3. The heavenly throne room where Satan and the angels of the Lord condemned over Joshua the high priest, contended over Joshua the high priest in the time of Grayson, Eliahab the high priest, which happened in the throne room. And the throne room is impressive setting throughout which we have already discovered from the book of Revelation, which I have clearly explained. But what happened? What come out of the mouth proceed from the heart? That's what the book of Matthew tells us. Do you not yet understand whatsoever entered in at the mouth go forth through the belly and is cast out into the drought? But those things which proceed after the mouth come forth from the heart and they can defy a man. So, what is this saying to us? That what comes out of the heart is what defiles a man. It's not what goes into a man through the mouth. The face after, this is metatata in Greek word, in Revelation, repeat twice in Revelation chapter 4, setting this is mark point or the beginning of the third vision. Division of Revelation chapter 1 verse 19. We have the first division in 1 verse 19. The things that are, which are the present days in the days of John, the things you can see. Then we have the second phase, the churches. The things that happen distance after the resurrection of Christ, after the apostle were gone, the churches. Then we have the third leg, the things that happen after the churches, which is the sex of the final showdown of the world event. If the first two take place, we should be rest assured that the third part will also take place. In verse 4, the heavenly perspective looked down on earth. The Bible was another important reference to heaven. In the passage, such as Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 to 8, Ezekiah 1, in the preceding tabernacle, and symbolic describe heaven, in Exodus chapter 25 to 32, and 35 to 40. In the description of the heavenly things, 
John uses the symbol and not everything is symbolic as in the parable of Jesus. Many of the details are merely descriptive and they are not necessarily intended to carry special significance of their own. Also, we, we should keep in mind the nature of symbolism. Symbolism is always less than reality. But sometimes, the reality of heaven is even greater than the description we have of it. It is very little that we can know of the future state, but we may be quite sure that we know as much as is good for us. We ought to be as content with that which is not revealed as with that which is. If God will us to know, we ought to be satisfied not to know. Depend on it. It has told us all about heaven that is necessary to bring us there. If we had revealed more, it would have served rather for the gratification of curiosity than for the increase of our grace. What these symbols we are actually talking about, we find it in Exodus chapter 22, Exodus chapter 25 to 32, the description of the place of worship, the earthly tabernacle of the children of Israel that was built by Moses. The same description are made symbolic of the heavenly tabernacles. So the earthly tabernacle and the heavenly tabernacle, they look similar, but they are not the same. So that was why the Christ died, he did not enter into the earthly tabernacle, but he directly ascended into the heavenly tabernacle, where he lived forever and died not. And because he lived forever, he is able to make intercession for the sin according to the will of God. So John is called up to heaven. After these things, I look and behold, a door was standing open in heaven. The first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, say, come up here. And I will show you the things that take place after the churches. After this thing, Revelation chapter 2 and 3 spoke of the churches, the seven churches, comprehended of all churches. And after Jesus has finished speaking to the churches, and after these things, John experienced the vision of four. Revelation 4. And the voice which I heard, the voice that spoke to John, in Revelation 1 verse 10, it spoke to him again here, the voice of Jesus, and called John up to heaven through a door standing open in heaven. Like a trumpet, the voice spoke loud and clear to John. It was like the trumpet that gathered the congregation of Israel together and gathered an army for battle. Come up here, and I will show you things which will take place after this. John will be shown things that concern the future, which will take place after the at the church era is over, not John present day. Some like interpret that John saw up through Revelation 19 as fulfilled in what took place before John's day. Notably, in Rome invasion and destruction of Jerusalem, Jesus clearly told John that he would show him things which will take place after this. So, some like interpreter that John saw up heaven through Revelation 19, fulfilling the history rather than the day before the present day. But this event may yet to be fulfilled in any sort of literal sense. They can only be said to have been fulfilled by making them widely symbolic. Wherefore, we regard what Jesus will show. John in the following chapter of Revelation as belonging to the future, as preceding the coming of the sign of Jesus on earth. Like a trumpet come up. Many see John's coming up to heaven as a symbolic of the rapture of the church. John was called up to heaven by a voice that sounded like a trumpet. Just like the church be described in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 to 17. Let us read. For clarity. First 
Thessalonians chapter 4 from verse 17. He said, Then we which are alive and remain shall be cut off with them in the cloud to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another in those words. 16 says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the strength of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be cut up together with him, with them in the cloud, to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. So this is what the Bible told us in 1 Thessalonians, which also pattern to the same trumpet, because I told you earlier that the Holy Spirit tends to use idiom consistently throughout the scripture, and which also pertain to the same trumpet that John heard saying, come up here and I will show you things that happen after the churches. So, we we'll go back to our reading in Revelation chapter 4. And we say it. And the pattern is significant. Jesus finished speaking to and deal with the churches in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. And all churches comprehended in the seven. Now, after dealing with the church, Jesus called off John to heaven, catching him away. Caught up. When we hear the word caught up, it's different from ascension. When Christ ascended, because many of us mistake caught up with the white throne judgment, when all the earth shall see Christ descending from the earth. There are two different things. In the first resurrection, believers are caught up to heaven. In the second coming of Christ, all the dead get raised to be judged on earth. Nobody goes to heaven. The white room judgment did not take place in heaven. The resurrection we're talking about in the second resurrection take place on earth. All the sea gave up their dead to be judged. But that is after the new Jerusalem and the new heaven. So try and understand the Bible without congestion. Cutting him away with a voice that sounded like a trumpet and all happened before the great world that will be described beginning at Revelation chapter 6. As the great judgment of the out on food, John, a representative of the church, was in heaven looking down on earth. Significantly, the word church never occurred in any of the chapter after chapter 3. From chapter 4, we never saw anything like church being mentioned. In the chapter describing the period of judgment on earth, nowhere in Revelation chapter 4 to 19 was the name church ever mentioned, because that concludes the reign of the church. So when we look at the vision of the revelation of the church age, we understand the reason why the church was never mentioned. The church has a beginning and it has an end. It starts in Pentecost and it ends with the rapture. That is the end of the church. And after the churches, there is a sore judgment for the people of the earth, the earth dwellers. But the saints will be cut off to heaven to meet with the Lord. I don't care what you decide to call it, rapture or whatever Greek name you give to it. The text is being cut off. The saints will be cut off. That's what I believe in. So we understand from that particular place the vision of heaven. In verse 9, we heard one of the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who lived forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders fell down before him that sat on the throne and worshipped him that lived forever and ever, casting before him their crown, saying, Thou listening to this praise of the elder to God. It's going to 
identify who they are to you if you are not convinced. He says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power, for thou hast created all things for thy pleasure, they are and were created. So if you go further to Revelation chapter 5, it said, And I saw a, at the right hand of one who sat upon a throne, a book was written within and on the back side, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to lose the seal thereof? Who? Who is worthy to open the book and to lose the seal thereof? No man in heaven, nor in earth, neither under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept very much. No man was found worthy to open the book and to read the book, neither look thereon. And what book are we really talking about? The scroll of God's judgment written in the hands of the Lord. Nobody was qualified to look into it. And when did they search? They searched the whole earth. They did not find any man worthy. They searched the heaven. They did not see one of the angels that was worthy to open the book. They searched under the earth. There was no man under the earth worthy to open the scroll or to read from it. And the Bible said it was sealed. And what is sealed? Sealed is a title deed, something you use to seal a document so that it cannot be read except by the person who has the ability to unseal such document. And this document we're talking about was sealed with seven seals. And that means when you open, break the first seal, one page will be available to you. When you break the second seal, the second page will be available to you. And we shall understand it better when we read the opening of the seal. Because they searched around the whole world. Nobody was qualified. Because all the earth could offer was the sacrifice of ram of goat by Moses, which cannot take away sin permanently. Because it only does it covers sins for one year. And after one year, another sacrifice needs to be offered. But Christ's sacrifice was perfected forever. The Bible says, with one sacrifice, what lamb could not attain, what rituals could not attain, with one sacrifice. He perfected forever those who were sanctified. If you were sanctified, one sacrifice of Christ was enough and was all you needed. And that is why when they searched, they could not find any man that was qualified. Everybody was given access to open the seal, but no man was qualified to open the seal or even to break the seal that was on it. Not even to touch the book. But do you know why John said, I wept much? Why was John weeping? Because despite all the saints we have on earth, all the religious zealots around the world, none was qualified. Not in the days of John, not in the future, not on the earth were qualified. That's why the Bible told us all our righteousness are as fading right before God. By what shall no man prevail? So we, no matter what we do, or holiness we think we can attain as human, we can never equal to that of God. It's as faithfulness before God. Where our wisdom stop, that is where his own begin. So no man, no matter who we are, we are limited in our thoughts. We are limited in our righteousness. We are limited in our wisdom. But something else happened. At last, behold, one of the elders came to me. One of the elders. Who? One of the elders. He said, because I wept. 
one of the elders said to him, Weep not. Behold, there is somebody, a lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, had prevailed to open the book and lose his seventh seal. The root of David. Why would Christ be the root of David? I suppose, I suppose it's supposed to be the offspring of David, not the root. The root of David has prevailed. He was the root and the offspring of David. Both roots. He brought David into existence. And he, that's what he asked the Pharisees that they were unable to answer. You say Christ is the offspring of David. How therefore David being in the vision says, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I meet that enemy, that footstool, and the end of this world shall be at that preservation. And the Pharisees were confused. How can David call Christ Lord when he's supposed to be his offspring? Because though he was the offspring of David, he brought David into a system. Because John made it clear to us in the book of John, in him was all things created. Without him was not anything made that was made. He brought all things to a system. But he came from the lineage of David. He was before the creation of the world. He was before the beginning of all things. But he also came, God became a man, and came through the lineage of David. That's why the Bible called him the root and the offspring of David. He prevailed, and we knew who they were talking about. The lion of the tribe of Judah, and of the root and the offspring of David, have prevailed to open the book and to lose the seven seal thereof. He has access to the throne. Why? We will understand the reason why he was able to break the seal. Why he was qualified. <laughs> Behold, no, in the midst of the throne, the seven and four elder, and in the midst of the elder stood the lamb as it was slain. The lamb. We understand that phrase from the Bible. Jesus Christ. And have seven horns and seven eyes. And which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. He owns, he has the spirit of God, the seven spirit of God. He was the word of God. And that's why John told you the word became flesh. The word God speaks became flesh and dwells among us. He has all the seven spirit of God indwelling in him. And he has the eyes of God, the cherubim and the seraphims indwelling in him. That are the eyes of God that run through and flow the earth. And he is omnipotent and omniscient God. And they say, man has prevailed. And he said, the lamb, he has seven horns. And seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent into all the earth. So that is where we know that the spirit of God has seven. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. He has direct access. When no man, no spirit, no demon, no powers on earth, in heaven, and under the earth was qualified. Because that's why the Lord gave him a name that is above all name. That at the name of Jesus, every name should bow. Whether of the things in heaven, or the things on earth, or the things under the earth, they should bow at the measure of the name of Jesus. Because he has direct access. And when he took the book, the four and twenty elders, the four living creatures and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, and every one of them has in a heart and a valve full of order, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seal thereof, for thou was slain. And has redeemed us to God 
by thy blood out of every kindred, tongues, people, and nation. So these 24 elders are representative of all living creatures, all kindred, tongues, people, and nation because of the blood of Christ who redeemed them from all the earths. That's why you need to continue to preach the gospel because you don't know one of you might qualify to sit with those elders on the last day and be decided over the judgment of the whole earth. Brethren, the elders were not chosen from the Old Testament. They were not the prophets, but they were chosen from the church. That is something very significant. Because he did not choose the wise and knowledgeable men of old. He chose from you, babies. Now, let's get a new perspective of what God has to say. In John, let's go to John goes up and the spirit immediately he was. John goes up in the spirit. Immediately he was in the spirit. Immediately I was in the spirit. John was John already said he was in the spirit in Revelation 1 verse 10 that he was in the spirit on the last day. But this was yet a different experience as John came to heaven and the heavenly perspective in the spirit. There was his body, John's body in heaven also. And was it also his spirit? Yes. This is impossible to know. Paul, when he had his heavenly experience, didn't know if he was in the body or not. A throne is set in heaven. Behold, a throne is set in heaven. One sat at the throne. On the throne. And we knew from this experience that Jesus isn't the Father. So many Christians try to equate Jesus Christ with the Father. We knew there was Jesus Christ as the Lord. We knew there was another person sitting on the throne, which was the Father. And we knew also that there was the Spirit of God which are the seven spirit of God sent throughout all the earth. The Holy Spirit is a distinct person. The Son is a distinct person. And the Father is a distinct person. But that's what they all agree in one. So that is exactly what you know from the book of Revelation. It's a clear picture of what you have been trying to explain throughout all your congestion as a Christian. God the Father exists. God the Son, Jesus Christ exists. And the Holy Spirit exists. Behold, a throne. This throne was the first impressed John. It was centerpiece of his vision. John was fixation on the occupied throne. Everything else is described in relation to his throne. The bottom line of atheism, materialism, is that there is no throne. <laughs> there is no seat of authority or power that the entire universe must answer to. But that is complete lie. We knew there is a truth. Because John explained and described the truth, how he looked like. The bottom line of humanism is that there is no, there is a truth. But man sit upon it. That's a lie. God sits on the truth. Essentially, man cannot live without the concept of a truth. The supreme ruler, if so if man dethrone God today, let's assume it can happen. He will inescapably place himself or some other man upon the throne, perhaps a political leader, such as in the case of dictator like Lenin, Stalin, or even Mao, to rule over them. Because man cannot live without the concept of a throne. And one sat on the throne. The throne is not empty. There is someone who sits on this great heavenly throne. The throne is a powerful 
declaration not merely of God present, but of his sovereign, rightful reign, his prerogative to judge, and ability to intercede. People does not sit upon the throne to clap a joke. People sit upon the throne to issue judgment, either on earth or in heaven. So there is judgment for evil to us. We can't think right about much of anything until we settle in our mind that there is an occupied throne in heaven. And the God of the Bible rules from the throne. While there may be many different interpretations, the fundamental truths are self evidence and the center of everything is an occupied throne. What John saw at heavenly throne? He who sat there was like a jasper, a sardine stone in appearance. There was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. And he who sat there was like, was, a, was like, as John described in the occupied throne, he did not describe the distinct finger. There is here no description of the divine being. So as to point to out any similitude, shape, or dimension, the description rather aim at points out the surrounding glory and the influence rather than the person of the Almighty. <laughs> Like Jasper and Sardine Stone in appearance. Instead of describing a specific form or figure, John described emanation of glistering lights in two columns. The Father of Lights. White Jasper means that red Sardius or Sardine. Perhaps there were two colors and met to communicate the glory of the empty tone, white. In Matthew 20, 28 verse 1 to 3, the sacrificial of love are covered with red, indicating blood. Perhaps they link with the first and last gems in the high priest bracelet. In Exodus chapter 39 from verse 8 to 13. There was a rainbow around about the throne. The throne was surrounded by a green hall rainbow in appearance like an emerald. And the rainbow is reminded of God's commitment to his covenant with man. In Genesis chapter 9 from verse 11 to 17. Around this city of all sovereign power and authority and glory, this setting of the throne of God, God has reminded of his promise to never destroy the earth again with water. A promise that directs his sovereignty so that it is not capricious or against his promise. A throne says, I can do whatever I want because I rule. A promise says, I will fulfill this word to you, and I cannot do otherwise. A rainbow around the throne is a remarkable thing, showing that God always limits himself by his own promise. That's why he said in the scripture, if I waste my great sword, my hand lay hold on judgment. Trap on the rainbow, which is signals, gracias. Or for it is a sign of grace and covenant of mercy, which is always fresh and green about Christ's throne of grace. Believer glories in the sovereign of God because he knows that God's sovereignty is on his side. It means that no good purpose of God relating to believer will ever be left undone.
That means he is a covenant keeping God. That you must take away from this lesson. That God is a covenant keeping God. When he says it is, he is bound to obey. He is not a man that he should lie. Neither is he the son of man that he should repent. Will he say it? Will he not do it? Has he made a promise? Will he not make it good? God is not a man that he should lie. He is not the son of man to repent of his sins. When he says anything, he is able to perform. And that is what he just showed you from the truth. John described the he, he, that means he's a man that sat upon the throne. We don't know who he is. He that sat upon the throne was to look upon like Jasper. John was not able to distinguish his figure because of the brightness of the light. And in Sandin Stone, Jasper and Sandin Stone, red and white, the color of light. And that's why the Bible calls him the father of light. He is the father of light, in whose hand there is no shadow of turning. So, what shape does he have? The Bible says in servant who see his face at the end of the day. We will be able to see him because we shall see him as he is. As he is in heaven, so shall we also be when we get there. And that is how the saint knows God. Christ risen. Remember, the distinction of Christ in chapter 1 was different from the description of John of the man that sat upon the throne. Christ's feet was like a bronze burning in finance. That is a symbol of judgment. And he has a golden guide. We knew that about Christ. But also God, in this case, the figures were slaves. He was to look upon like a sandy stone. And emerald. Rainbow like emerald around about the throne. And that's why whenever rain falls today on earth, we see the rainbow in the sky as a reminder of God's covenant he made with Noah. That means more than 200,000 years after the death of Noah, God still remember his covenant he made with man. That shows you God is not a man that he should lie. He is not the son of man that he should repent. When he says a thing, he will do it. When he promises, he will bring it to pass. If you should fear nothing, you should fear because of the promises he has made. Because everything he said, he is able to perform. And if you know that God is able to perform what he says, you should more be more fearful and respectful. That's why the Bible says, having the terror of the Lord, you will persuade men. And that's what today, you must remember what he did with the rainbow on the throne. We are far into the future. At the end of the war, the rainbow was not destroyed. The covenant he made with man, that world, the world will not be overrun by water, system. Despite all our ocean encroachment, our global warming, and everything happening on earth, God covenant system. That means he cannot destroy the whole world with water. And that is remarkable of God. This shows you that his covenant in your life cannot be changed. God is not a man that changes word at will. Or the prophet that will tell you, I prophesied that will be rain last day. Oh, it's not, it's by mistake the rain decided before. No, he is not that kind of God. When God says a thing, he means what he says, and he says what he means. And his word will surely come to pass. God cannot lie. His word in your life and mine, his word regarding the rapture, the judgment of the same, they will all come to pass. And that alone should make you believe or disbelieve in him. Then the question remains today. Now you knew that God keep his covenant. Does this persuade you for you to hold on to what the scripture writes? And the true word of God to change your life and prepare for his coming? Or does this turn your heart away and make you believe that you can do anything you like that you don't give a damn about God? Knowing that he will bring all things into judgment. The throne you saw in heaven 
already showed you there is a king over there. And judgment is imminent because the king executes judgment. Just as our earthly king here executes judgment, both upon the righteous and the judge, just as Paul told you that the king, you should honor the king as supreme because he beareth not the sword in vain. So also your heavenly father does not bear the sword in vain. So there is a reward for doing good and there is a reward for doing evil. But the choice is yours to make. And that is what we take out from this lesson. God bless you. We hope to meet you again by next week Sunday by 5 p.m. Brethren, if you have been listening to this message or you have missed any of this teaching, like letters to the churches, you can search our website at cgfnslogin.app. Then you can have a feel of all our training. And you can also use the opportunity to join our Open Heart Fellowship at CGF Open Heart Fellowship. This is a non-denominational fellowship. It's set for all believers and every Christian who we want to have a feel of the Word of God. Brethren, this is where we end our today's teaching. We, before we pray, I want to invite you to meet, join with us every Tuesday in CJF Open House Fellowship as we take a hint at the scriptures to expose the word of God that leads to salvation. This period we are on, still on the training on mission. So we will be taking the next topic on Tuesday and we will, the time is 7 p.m. Swedish time. In Africa, the time is 8 p.m. local time. God bless you as you participate. Let us pray. Father, we thank you once again. Your word, there are no accidents. In your commitments, there are no repentance. When you say a word, you mean what you say. When you speak, you keep your promise. When you decree, you are able to perform. Father, we know who you are. You are not a man that should lie. You are not the son of man that you should repent. The, you redeem us from the earth. And you made us king and priest unto our God. And we shall reign with you on the earth. What a wonderful God we serve. O oh Lord, to you belongs the issue from death. You who has made us perfect in all things. And has given us wisdom, knowledge to interpret your word and to open up all the hidden mystery. Lord, as we look into your word next week, may you give us the grace to understand the seal and to break loose all the seal and to explain it in a language that the people will understand. Lord, we pray thee for as many that are listening to this word that are still leaping between two opinions. They are still not convinced about your judgment. Oh Lord, we pray that you draw them to yourself. Because no man can actually come to you and search the Father and draw it in. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God bless you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.